We get ever closer to the launch of Nintendo 64 with Nintendo Power number 78 for November of 1995, and we have Mortal Kombat 3 coverage this issue. Our cover game for this issue is Mortal Kombat 3 with Cyrax featured. The letters column has gotten a bit of a visual overhaul, and Nintendo is fanning the flames of rabid fanboyism, complete with what looks like Gamergate's legit face. Man, that, that mess just really ripped the mask off the whole ugly console war and everything that that ended up feeding into. Yeah. In the power charts, Super Mario Kart and Secret of Evermore are returning to the Super Nintendo Top 20, and Earthworm Jim 2 is new to the chart. The game ranking for this issue is for RPGs, and we have no Hall of Fame inductees this issue. Instead, we have Virtual Boy rankings instead. Nintendo, stop trying to make fetch happen. We have our cover game, the Super Nintendo version of Mortal Kombat 3. We have notes on most of the game's roster, along with the code to play as Smoke, and a whole slew of combat codes. That's combat and code with a K, because of course it is. Mortal Kombat 3 for the Super Nintendo is a very unforgiving version of the game. This is definitely a game that, while it is not an arcade-perfect conversion by any means, if you want something close to that, you'll have to get a PlayStation, it does bring the arcade version's desire to eat every quarter in your pocket to the home. I, mean, I generally got a good grasp of the controls, but I never got a sense that I, was, that I was getting good at the game, or at least against the AI. There is a definite sense here that the way to beat the AI isn't through becoming a better player at the game, but for more learning how to cheese the AI. But this is actually a problem with fighting games. Um, or what I was going to say, with, a, with certain fighting games, is that what you want in a single player mode in a fighting game is a gameplay mode that teaches you the skills with the various characters that you need when you're playing against other people. That if you come that once you've come through your arcade mode or story mode or what have you, you can confidently say, okay, I have gotten a handle of this character, I can then take them online or to the arcade or to a tournament or whatever, and have a good general sense of what I'm trying to do. And I don't get that from MK3 on the SNES. What I get from this version of the game is, figure out the right way to cheese the AI to proceed through this and get the ending. Which will not help you against other people. In fact, will actually hinder you by, ingrain by teaching you bad habits, which other players, which human players, can easily punish you for doing. So, moving on, it's been 10 years since the launch of the, of the NES, so we get, basically, Nintendo's company line on the launch of the platform. They get to the impact the crash of 84 had on the redesign of, of on the NES. They literally talk about what the crash of 84 was, with um, Atari flooding the, or I should say, uh, the market for the Atari 2600 games getting flooded, with lots of low-quality, poor games, um, which retailers couldn't sell, and thus... In, along with like Atari themselves cranking out large production runs of crappy games like Atari Pac-Man, like um, E.T. the Extraterrestrial, leaving retailers stuck holding lots of inventory that, that they just couldn't move and either sending it back to Atari unsold, causing them to take a financial hit, or just take eating a loss and dropping the um, price down to nothing. Thus, in turn, forcing... Nintendo, when they got in the market, to issue the top loader design of the Famicom, and instead specifically choosing to take a design that emulates the appearance of a, well, VCR, along with the inclusion of Rob to cash in the, on the appeal of Teddy Ruxpin, with, with instead of the Teddy Ruxpin and the tape deck that's involved with that, it is a the Rob with the control deck, which looks a lot like a VHS tape deck, or other, it doesn't look like it, but is meant to evoke the feel of a VHS tape deck, although none of those pro third-party products, not Teddy Ruxpin, not the Atari 2600, or the other consoles that were clobbered by the ca crash of 84, are particularly name-checked in this article. We have another brawler this issue with Spider-Man and Venom and separation anxiety which appears to use the same engine as maximum carnage we get level maps and notes for pretty much all the levels in the game 
Well, Separation Anxiety plays a lot like Maximum Carnage, controls a lot like Maximum Carnage, has the same art style as Maximum Carnage, but without some of the additional elements that made Maximum Carnage work, like guest appearances by other Marvel characters as striker characters, you know, like Captain America and Firestar. It's fun enough, but considering that this is a little more expensive than Maximum Carnage in general, I don't know if I'd recommend picking this game up over the other one unless you're just trying to collect all the Spider-Man games for the SNES, in which case, more power to you. With the end of this console generation fast approaching, we have our sports scene column for this issue with the last wave of big sports titles, your Maddens, and so on, including Tecmo uh, Super Bowl 3, which I believe is the last Tecmo Super Bowl game to come out on, the, on a Nintendo platform, at least Nintendo console. Our next game is Big Sky Trooper, an action game that appears to be using the same engine as Zombies Ate My Neighbors, with the same general size of the game. We have notes on gameplay in several levels. Big Sky Trooper may run on the same engine as Zombies Ate My Neighbors, but it doesn't play as well as Zombie Ate My Neighbors. The game that game had give you a wide variety of weapons very early out of the gate, with a variety of range of ranges and um, tools in terms of utility to let you cut through certain elements of the environment and thus allowing you to adjust your tactics based on what the environment is and what type of enemies you're fighting. Big Sky Trooper, not so much. They give you out of the gate a very limited zap gun with not a lot of options to upgrade your weapons in these early missions. Having a spread shot or a bomb or a grenade or something would make this game so much more fun from the get-go. I mean, maybe get fun later, but considering how well Zombies Ate My Neighbors hit the ground running, and how that game came out two years earlier, this is just a huge disappointment. If this were 1993, in terms of where what issue of Nintendo Power we were on, and I was reviewing Big Sky Troopers, then I might be forgiving. LucasArts should have known better. Last issue, we had a gross-out platformer with, ah, real monsters! This issue, we have another with Boogerman. We get a slew of in-depth level maps. Boogerman is from pretty much the same school as Ah! Real Monsters and Earthworm Jim before it. It's a platformer with big expansive levels, very fluid character animations, clearly inspired by, you know, fluid television and film animation, and a very deliberately calculated gross aesthetic designed to appeal to 8 to 10 year old boys and to annoy and gross out their parents and their sisters. The problem is, is it's not a good game. The level designs are poor with some far too finicky platforming in some of the early levels, though thankfully without a lot of bottomless pits. It's not as terrible as some of the other games we've covered on this show, particularly considering that last issue I covered Batman Forever, but it's not a game I've actively seek out. I mean, if I got a copy in a grab bag, I wouldn't put it straight into my trade-in pile, but that's also very much damning with the faintest, faintest praise. In Epic Center News, we have a coverage of the Square SIGGRAPH demo, which is the uh, Square N64 demo, which had a simulated Final Fantasy battle interface, which gave a lot of people the expectation that, oh, Square is going to stick with Nintendo and the N64 for Final Fantasy VII, when, no, not so much. Like, by this point, they were probably pretty much on their way out the door. We have an article on Wizard's Realm, and I have no idea what this is. It looks like something off of an IRC RP server, a roleplay server. It doesn't feel quite like a mud, mush, or muck, um, which, for those who you are aren't familiar with those terms, those are basically text-based MMORPGs that existed pre-traditional graphical MMORPGs. Um, you'd play them over Telenet, and all the interface would be text-only. However, I can't find anything on what this is. If any of you are familiar with this and have a lead, please let me know in the comments. We finally get the start of a strategy guide for Secret of Evermore, covering several early areas of the game with notes and limited maps. Secret of Evermore is a game that is a little weird. It's why described as the first Western created game that is deliberately emulating JRPGs. Except it's from the Western arm of a Japanese game studio, Squaresoft. 
as opposed to from a wholly American company. The game starts off with the implication that it's going to be taking something of more Earthbound-inspired take on things, with the protagonist being a generic Midwestern every town, only one still more grounded to, due to the developers being from the U.S. and having clearly some experience with that, and with the protagonist having a character design that's clearly inspired by Michael J. Fox as Marty McFly in Back to the Future, especially with the vest. However, like Marty McFly, he's sent back in time, but first to caveman times, but instead when his parents were his age. And then we move into the, the combat section, which is very action RPG and very clearly inspired by Secret of Mana, with the your weapon meter having to recharge to get your full effective damage in combat. And then once we get the first town, we get introduced to the magic system, and where things kind of get odd. Because the game issues a traditional magic system of magic points and having a list of spells in favor of one along the lines of the Ultima series. We have to gather reagents to power your magic, and your magic spells level up individually as you cast them. But you can't experiment with the reagents that you gather. Part of the fun with games like Ultima is... Certainly you get to find some spells through quests and that sort of thing, but once you get reagents and stuff, you can theoretically just fiddle out, experiment with them, see what you get, if you get anything at all, and just as easily, purely by accident, possibly end up stumbling across the Armageddon spell. Not so much here, which is frustrating. The game also has some issues with navigation traversal. The color palette of the early areas of the game is much darker than Secret of Mana, which leads to some issues with distinguishing where you can or can't go in those early areas of the game. For example, in the first uh, village, I had difficulty distinguishing where the different air levels of the village are um, due to where the ledges are being not quite noticeable. I was able to, like, if I looked really closely, find the the stair steps and ramps and that sort of thing, but not necessarily, but it still would, was enough of a, a lack of contrast that it ended up running into walls every now and then as I'm trying to find my way around the village and explore. Now for Chrono Trigger, we get notes on side quests and several of the possible endings. In the classified information, we get a new logo for the classified information column this issue. We're kind of dumping the um, stamp logo. And in the cheats, we have a cheat to allow you to beat the Kobayashi Maru scenario, which honestly seems appropriate. Next is a puzzle game, which I swear I've reviewed before, but apparently have not. Zoop. Zoop is a matching puzzle game that does several things right that a lot of other puzzle games don't. At least of the matching variety, anyway. First off, all of the puzzle pieces, in addition to having different colors, also have very different shapes to them, which means that if you're colorblind, you shouldn't have any problems with this game. Which, I know, is a significant problem for people with some puzzle games. Now, in addition to that, just the game just plays incredibly well. The difficulty curve is well-tuned, the way the mechanics work is generally well-executed, though I'd like the ability to store a piece for later, and it's very straightforward. You have pieces approaching you from several different directions. You push the pieces back by matching pieces of the same type. Um, color, shape, that sort of thing. And then you swap your type of piece by matching, by basically going to a row that is of a different type and just swapping them. And you just keep doing that until, well, the pieces reach the middle of the board. It's an endless style puzzle game like Tetris. It could stand the improvement of having the ability to store a piece for later to guys quickly swap out with, considering that the game doesn't really use all the pieces, or I say all the buttons, on the uh, D-pad. So, like, having the option would be a nice one, but otherwise, it's fine. It feels like a game that could have caught on more if it hadn't come out at the very tail end of the Super Nintendo's life. And also helped kind of with the fact that the visual aesthetic of this game just matches the style of the early 90s with the way the menus are laid out, typeface choices, it's just 
perfectly mid 90s in all the right visual ways. Moving on to the Virtual Boy section and games which I'm not going to be reviewing, we start off with the only movie tie-in for the system and probably the most apt one, Waterworld. We follow up with Virtual League Baseball, a baseball game with no licensed teams. And from there we go to Counselor's Corner where we have more tips for Tecmo's Secret of the Stars. We start off the Game Boy section with the first of a pair of Game Boy ports of Super Nintendo games with Killer Instinct. We have some notes on the slightly reduced roster. Killer Instinct for the Game Boy is a decent port of the game. Rare is using the same port of sort of pre-rendered sprites they use for the Game Boy version of Donkey Kong Country, with one significant difference. The Game Boy version of Donkey Kong Country, Donkey Kong Land, had the level environments in the same sort of pre-rendered sprite style that was used for the characters, which kind of made for something of an overall muddy display. Here, the backgrounds are left very muted and truly in the background, almost at like a Tiger Electronics LED level of just kind of faded and pushed to the back. Still noticeable and distinct, but not anything that is prominent. Th this lets the characters come to the fore. And on top of this, the reduced roster appears to they appear to have put the focus, in terms of what characters they selected, on ones who had the most distinctive silhouettes. This makes sure that the main characters that the players are encountering are ones who stand out on screen and are visually distinctive from each other, so you know what you're fighting against and what their special abilities are, as opposed to the palette swaps that are core to Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat, where, you know, Scorpion and uh, Sub-Zero sprite-wise are pretty similar. Maybe their body language is a little different, but otherwise they're pretty similar characters, but their movesets and what they can do to you are very different. And so that helps improve recognition and makes the game more playable, both for single and multiplayer, if you're playing this over a system link. Still not a great game, but it's... They, they, they learn the right lessons from other uh, ports to the Game Boy. The other Super Nintendo to Game Boy part of the issue is Super Return of the Jedi with several level maps. Super Return of the Jedi on the Game Boy, on the one hand, manages its level environments and density of enemies fairly well. In the Super Nintendo version, I had a devil of the time making it to the first boss, whereas here I made it to the first boss with all three lives intact, but only for here the boss to thoroughly kick my butt because I couldn't get a lineup on the enemy to do damage to them and get enough of a solid head in, hit in to decrease their life bar, and on top of all of that I couldn't really quite tell where on screen the enemy's life bar was, and that's with a enlarged view as an emulator. I can't imagine trying to pick out the boss's health on an actual Game Boy screen with all the problems that system had with, you know, video, video smearing. I appreciate the work that went into this, but the it, execution doesn't quite pan out. Finally, we wrap up this the games this issue with another two-pack of arcade ports with Defender and Joust. To be blunt, Defender does not work on a monochrome screen. You have to have different colors in order to differentiate in the little radar display at the top of the screen who the enemies are and who the humans are, and this port doesn't have that. Now, this is a Super Game Boy Advance version, maybe the Super Game If you plug it in Super Game Boy, it'll cover that, but the thing is, this also has to work in a handheld system as well, and it doesn't. Joust, on the other hand, control-wise, works okay, the controls are solid, but there isn't enough room on the screen to properly maneuver your ostrich, and because it's monochrome, I occasionally have some difficulties differentiating the sprite I control from my enemies. Now, Super Game Boy version, probably the, the color issues are less of an actual problem, but unless they're doing the thing that they did with, you know, um, Space Invaders, where it's just a full-on arcade port of the game on there, with using the full screen at your disposal without any of the frame um, around it emulating the uh, quote-unquote arcade display, that's not actually going to be that helpful, because if you're still keeping the same field of view, you're still going to run into the same problems with not having enough room to maneuver. 
Like, when I want to progress further, because, not because I want to get higher scores and succeed at the game, but because I want to have more platforms disappear so I have room to maneuver, you're doing something wrong in Joust. Instead, I recommend, like, getting Balloon Fight instead. We have no Ulcerans in the now playing column this issue. Everything here is either stuff that's, like, directly covered this issue either on its own or as a sports game. And finally, in Pack Watch, we have a Scooby-Doo adventure game coming up in a very point-and-click style, along with Mega Man X3 and the announcement that GoldenEye is going to the N64. My pick of the issue this time is actually Zoop. It is the mid-90s puzzle game that I wish I'd heard about sooner, and which I think have gotten some really serious legs. I don't know how you'd execute the game on mobile, but I can see the game doing really well on widescreen televisions, and I would love to see whoever owns the rights to this game, Viacom, I don't know. Um, I don't know what happened to that game developer or publisher. Um, doing a reimagining for modern game systems, I think it could be a really great little visual style to it. Next issue's featured game is Donkey Kong Country 2, which we've covered a little bit. And we got that and see what else is there in store. the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.